Pastor Carrasco. Um, Pastor Richards, who uh, is uh, probably on the way here now, and um, Pastor Sankey and myself, I know those names, uh, even though they weren't coming to me, are going to do a series together. This is the series. Um, this is the notes that you should be following through. This is 18 parts that we've broken up amongst ourselves. We're going to begin with the first one. Um, I hope you like the cover here. Um, Brother Marco designed this for us. The title of this presentation is The Prophetic Chain. And Brother Marco reminded me um, to point out, as you walk out of here, on the left-hand side you'll see some sales materials, but on the right hand of the wall you'll see some charts stuck on the wall. Those are charts that are, Lord willing, in the near future going to be produced. The reason that they're hanging on the wall is for all of you that wish to, to look over those charts. If you see any errors in dates or spelling or theology or anything that you just go ahead and you note it on the chart. And uh, we figure we have a lot of minds here and this is one of the last copy editings that we can do on these charts so that when they get produced those errors aren't retained if there are any. So that's what those charts are on the wall for. Feel free to look them over and give us your input. Um, what we're going to do here with, these, with this series is we're going to identify that the three-one combination of Bible prophecy, which for us probably the main understanding is the three angels' messages that came into history in the Millerite time period, followed by the fourth angel's message, which is fulfilled in our time period, this three-one combination is the link in the prophetic chain. And we're going to say that there is a chain of prophecy that begins in the Garden of Eden and it goes all the way to the second coming of Christ. And that, as we all know, in a chain, every link is the same. They're connected to one another, but they're the same. And we're going to go through and look at the different links in the chain of prophetic history and identify why they are the same but then draw the lessons from those that apply here at the end of the world. And what we're going to identify is that the 3-1 combination is the link in each of these histories. And once you see that, then you have the prophetic authority based upon Isaiah 28 to bring these histories, these 3-1 histories together line upon line, very similar to the teaching that we do on the reform lines that all of us share. We're just approaching the same truth from the perspective of a prophetic chain. Once we have these three one combinations in place, we're going to take the time to identify them and then isolate just the fourth part of each of those links because of time. And we're going to understand that the fourth way mark in the three one combination is the way mark that is most specifically pointing to the fourth angel's message to our history. So as we go back into the history of Adam and Eve and we see this 3-1 combination, we're going to see Christ, Adam, and Eve in the garden. Okay? And we're going to identify that the fourth way mark in this history is Abel. And this fourth way mark is pointing to the end of the world of the fourth angel's message. And the story of Abel is the story of the everlasting gospel, so we're going to deal with how the everlasting gospel that's illustrated with Cain and Abel there in the very first link of the chain, what that teaches for us at the end of the world. And we're going to do that with several of the links in the chain of prophetic history. And as we divide it up, the, the, the presentations on the different links, on the different 3-1 combinations, there are some of those links that the light that is now shining from them is so interesting and so much fun that some of us that are going to share these different presentations, we were desiring to get to be the one that got to share that particular link because there is some, I mean when you get to the disobedient prophet or Josiah or, anyway you'll see, this is an interesting study. But it also has very serious implications about what's going on here at the end of the world. So, if you'll turn to page 5, this is where 
Um, this study starts page five in these notes, the prophetic chain will start. I'm going to do a little bit of reading here in this first presentation to put some context. And I'll, I'll be doing reading, but not such long passages as in this first presentation. Okay, um, from Prophets and Kings, beginning on page 535, it says, while nations have rejected God's principles and in this rejection have wrought their own ruin, yet a divine overruling purpose has manifestly been at work throughout the ages. It was this that the prophet Ezekiel saw in the wonderful rep representation given him during his exile in the land of the Chaldeans. What did he see? He saw that there was a divine overruling purpose that had been involved with every history. It was this that Ezekiel saw, this divine overruling purpose while in ex exile in the land of the Chaldeans, when before his astonished gaze were portrayed the symbols that re revealed an overruling power that has to do with the affairs of earthly rulers. <clears throat> now, in my home, I'm the earthly ruler. Okay, So you, you can approach this truth from you know, the presidents and the kings in the world today, or you can approach this truth from our own little homes and our little, own little experience. So we can draw from this lesson. I was talking to a sister and brother today that are in a struggle, and I know several people in here right now that are in personal struggles. And we need to remember that there's a divine overruling power working in all these earthly situations. Okay, so this the prophetic level is many times dealing with the kings and the ebb and flow of the papacy in the United Nations and the United States. <coughs> While the United States is forming an image of the beast, Seventh-day Adventists individually are either forming the image of the beast or the image of Christ, which will be manifested at the Sunday law in the United States. So the, the obvious worldwide implications of prophecy need to be internalized into our own experiences. But this is what Ezekiel was seeing. Second paragraph, upon the banks of the river Chibar, Ezekiel beheld a whirlwind seeming to come forth from the north. A great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof as the color of amber. Who's this? What's this? This is the Lord, right? In the sanctuary. But where's he come from? Ah. Who's the king of the north impersonating? All right, God. All right, this, this is the story of the king of the north. A number of wheels intersecting one another were moved by li four living beings. And when we're saying Ezekiel's will within wheels, what I want you to see here, if you will, at the beginning, Ezekiel's seen wheels within wheels. And we're going to say that in one sense he was seeing a link in a chain within a link in a chain. Okay, could you call a link in a chain a type of a wheel within a wheel? Okay. Um, high above all these was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man above upon it and there appeared in the cherubims the form of a man's hand under the wings. The wheels were so complicated in arrangement that in, at first sight they appeared to be in confusion yet they moved in perfect harmony. What I'm saying is that these wheels are the links in the chains and the link in the chain is the 3-1 combination. And I've had the privilege of sharing the 3-1 combination for over 20 years now to Adventists. And when you show the 3-1 combination to people the first time, you show the 3-1 combination in the time of Christ, and then you put the 3-1 combination in the time of Moses, and then the 3-1 combination in the time of the Millerites on a board, and, and everyone's sitting there and they see it, they get the logic, but it's... Please don't ask me to repeat it. I see it, but I, it's just too complicated for me. It's too complicated. That's, that's what is being said here. It says, The wheels were so complicated in arrangement that at what? First, First sight. First time you see it. This is too much for me. You know, I don't want to be a student of prophecy. But, but after you see it a few times, you see that it is so simple yet so profound that it's just overwhelming, okay? And this is what Ezekiel's seen in these wheels and within the wheels. The wheels were so complicated in arrangement that at first sight they appeared to be in confusion, yet they moved in perfect harmony. Heavenly beings, sustained and guided by the hand beneath the winds of the cherubims, were impelling those wheels above them. Upon the sapphire throne was the eternal one, and round about the throne was a rainbow, the emblem of divine mercy. This is one of the good... 
um, paragraphs in here in terms of, of pulling a definition out of this. It says, as the will-like complications were under the guidance of the hand beneath the wings of the cherubim, cherubim, so the complicated play of human events is under divine control. This is a definition, Sister White saying that the will-like combinations are the complicated play of human events. All right. And who's in control of those complicated events? Christ. He's in control of them all. All right. Amidst the strife and tumult of nations, he that sitteth above the cherubim still guides the affairs of the earth. This history of nations speaks of to us today. To every nation and to every individual, God has assigned a place in his great plan. Today men and nations are being tested by the plummet in the hand of him who makes no mistake. All are by their own choice deciding their destiny, and God is overruling in the overruling all for the accomplishment of his purposes. This is another good paragraph for this study. The prophecy which the great I am has given in his word, uniting what? Link after link in the chain of events from eternity in the past to eternity in the future tells us where we are today in the possession of the ages and what may be expected in the time to come. Do you realize what she's saying? Yep. She's saying those links, those former histories, Tell us where we are today. Hmm? Okay. That's what you're saying. Nothing to fear for the future except we forget the past. If you don't know what those links were in the past, you don't know where you are today. Okay. And you need to know why you are to, where you are today. We're required to know. It would be just as fatal for us not to know what's coming as it was for the antediluvians to not know when the flood was coming. That's Sister White in the Great Controversy. We need to know where we are today. All the prophecy has foretold is coming to pass until the present time has been traced, upon, traced on the pages of history, and we may be assured that all which is yet to come will be fulfilled in its order. What's its order? The three-one combination. Every link in the chain is the same. There's a specific order to the three-one combination. It comes in its order, and its order is established by the very first link in Eden. And it's the same all the way through. All right. Today the signs of the times declare that we are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. Do they? Yeah. <laughs> you can't deny that today, can you? We're on the threshold. Planet Earth realizes it's on the threshold of some great and solemn events. Everything in our world is in agitation. Before our eyes is the Savior's is the is fulfilling the Savior's prophecy of the events to precede His coming. Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. The present time, the present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. Rulers and statesmen who occupy positions of trust and authority, thinking men and women of all classes, have their attention fixed upon the events taking place before us. In fact, the only people in the world that don't have their attention fixed upon the events taking place before us are Seventh-day Adventists. Yes. It's the only ones. There are, they are watching the relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity that is taking possession of every earthly element and they recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place and that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. Amen. The Bible and Bible only gives a correct view of these things. Here are revealed the great final scenes in the history of our world, events that are already casting their shadow before. The sound of their approach caused the earth to tremble and men's hearts to fill them for fear. Now this, this next quote is a very similar quote from Testimonies, Volume 5. Some of the same things are said, but I want to draw a couple more expressions from there so they're put in place for this whole presentation. This is just the introduction, so you'll you have to bear with us here on this one, all right? The vision was given to Ezekiel at a time when his mind was filled with gloomy forebodings. He saw the land of his fathers lying desolate. The city that was once full of people was no longer inhabited. The voice of mirth and song of praise were no more heard within her walls. The prophet himself was a stranger in a strange land where boundless ambition and savage cruelty reigned supreme. That which he saw and heard of human tyranny and wrong distressed his soul and he mourned bitterly day and night. 
But the wonderful symbols presented before him beside the river Jabbar revealed an overruling power mightier than that of earthly rulers. Above the proud and cruel monarchs of Assyrian Babylon, the God of mercy and truth was enthroned. The wheel-like com complications that appeared to the prophet to be involved in such confusion were under the guidance of an infinite hand. The Spirit of God revealed to him as moving and directing these wheels brought harmony out of confusion. So the whole world was under his control. Myriads of glorified beings were ready at his word to overrule the power and policy of evil men and bring good to his faithful ones. In like manner, and here's the part I want you to see. Now Sister White's going to tie this understanding given to Ezekiel with the same understanding that was given to John the Revelator and Isaiah and every prophet that saw the child's own vision. In like manner, when God was about to open to the beloved John the history of the church for future ages, he gave him an insurance of the Savior's interest and care for his people by revealing him one like unto the Son of Man, walking among the, ca the candlesticks which, symbol which symbolize the seven churches. What are the candlesticks? What are they? Not where are they, what are they? Okay, but what are they? Periods of time, what are they? They're a link. They're a link in the prophetic chain, all right? John's seeing the same wheel-like combinations, only they're being expressed through different symbols, all right? Can you show that the, the church of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia are all repeated in the history of Laodicea? Yes. Is the history of Laodicea the, the fourth angel's message? Yes. So these histories, these candlesticks, are just another symbol of the links in the prophetic chain. And, and here, Sister White is telling us that the will-like combinations of Ezekiel are paralleling the candlesticks of John. Am I stretching that? No, yeah. Okay. So. No, no, okay. In like manner, when God was about to open to the beloved John the history of the church for, the, for future ages, he gave him an assurance of the Savior's interest and care for his people by revealing to him one like unto the Son of Man, walking among the candlesticks which symbolize the seven churches. While John was shown the last great struggles of the church with earthly powers, he was also permitted to behold the final victory and deliverance of the faithful. He saw the church brought into deadly conflict with the beast in his image and the worship of that beast enforced on pain of death. But looking beyond the smoke and din of battle, he beheld a company up on Mount Zion with the Lamb having instead of the mark of the beast the Father's name written in their foreheads. Praise the Lord. And again he saw them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand in the sea of glass having the harps of God and singing the songs of Moses, song of Moses and the Lamb. These lessons are for our benefit. We need to stay our faith upon God. For there is just before us a time that will try men's soul. Christ upon the Mount of Olives rehearsed the fearful judgments that were to precede his second coming. Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. While these prophecies received a partial fulfillment at the destruction of Jerusalem, they have a more direct application to the last days. We are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. Prophecy is fast fulfilling. The Lord is at the door. There is soon to open before us a period of overwhelming interest to all living. The controversies of the past are to be revived. New controversies will arise. The scenes to be enacted in our world are not yet even dreamed of. Satan is at work through human agencies. Those who are making an effort to change the Constitution and secure a law enforcing Sunday observance little realize what will be the result. A crisis is just upon us. But God's servants are not to trust them to themselves in this great emergency. In the visions given to Isaiah, to Ezekiel, and to John, where we see how closely heaven is connected with the events taking place upon the earth and how great is the care of God for those who are loyal to him. What are the, what are the theologian, theologians call the writings of Isaiah? What, what, what title do they give him? Gospel. The Gospel Prophet. But here Sister White is saying that Isaiah is portraying the events that Ezekiel and John portrayed. 
The similarity between Isaiah and Ezekiel and John is the emphasis on these events. What are the events? They're the prophetic events. I guess maybe the prophetic events is the gospel. Amen. And that's probably why they call Isaiah the gospel prophet. Because he's laying out the events connected with the close of probation, just as John does, just as Ezekiel does, just as all the prophets do. And if they preach any other gospel than this, what does Paul say? Let them be accursed. In the visions given to Isaiah, to Ezekiel, and to John, we see how closely heaven is connected with the events taking place upon the earth and how great is the care of God for those who are loyal to Him. The world is not without a ruler. The program of coming events is in the hand of the Lord. The majesty of heaven has the destiny of nations as well as the concerns of His church and His own char charge. We permit ourselves to feel altogether too much care, trouble, and perplexity in the Lord's work. Don't we, though? <laughs> Don't we, though? Anyone suffered any care and perplexity over the last week in the Lord's work? <clears throat> Finite men are not left to carry the burden of responsibility. We need to trust in God, believe in Him, and go forward. The tireless vigilance of the heavenly messengers and their unceasing employment and their ministry in connection with the beings of earth shows how God's hand is guiding the will within the will. The divine instructor is saying to every actor in his work, as he said to Cyrus of old, I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. In Ezekiel's vision, God had his hand beneath the wings of the cherubim. This is to teach his servants that it is divine power that gives them success. He will work with them if they will put away iniquity and become pure in heart and life. The bright light going among the living creatures with the swiftness of lightning represents the speed with which this work will finally go forward to completion. Brothers and sisters, the work is going forward now. If you, if you have eyes to see, you can see that it is going forward all over planet Earth now. There is evidence you can give testimony. I can look out in this audience here and I can see several countries of the world representing the people that are carrying this message to those countries in just this little room. And we're not everyone in the world that is handling this message. I don't even know. And I'm not, I'm not a website guy, but I don't even know how many websites there are that are placing this message before the world today. But there are many. There are many. There's a brother in this room that, he, that none of us knew. He came across this message and he, did, he already had a website set up that he was doing Bible studies with friends on and he came across this message and I remember this guy I didn't know emailing me saying, is it alright if I put your material on, on our website? He says, fine. Before long people will tell me about this website that this guy's raised up with this material. He's here. He's here. Amen. And it, 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 there's websites like that that are popping up all over. The point is, the lightning represents the speed with which this work goes forward once it starts. And brothers and sisters, it's worthwhile if you're going to be involved with this message to understand that it is now going forward. What's that mean? That means if we don't put away the iniquity so that the Lord can use us at this time, we're going to get left behind and we are going to be lost. Right? Isn't, isn't that the context in what she just said here? The Lord will work with us if we we'll put the sin and iniquity away. But if we don't, we're in the time period when the work is going forward like lightning. We're going to be lost. He who slumbers not, who is continually at work for the accomplishment of his designs can carry forward his great work harmoniously. That which appears to finite minds entangled and complicated, the Lord's hand can keep in perfect order. He can devise ways and means to thwart the purposes of wicked men, and he will bring confusion, bring to confusion the counsels of them that plot mischief against his people. Brothers and sisters, fortunately, I've had the privilege of seeing that happen more than once. 
I've seen people try to attack this message and they get brought to confusion before your very eyes. It's, it's sad. It's sad. But God's Word never fails. And He protects and defends His Word. Amen. So, we know that the beginning of Adventism illustrates the end of Adventism. The beginning of the Millerite history has many parallels to the end of the Millerite history. Uh, I like the one where at the beginning of our history, Sister White has a vision where she goes into the Most Holy Place and sees the Ten Commandments and sees the Sabbath and what she see in connection with the Sabbath commandment. The, it, it, there was a, a glow around the Sabbath commandment, right? Have you ever read the passage where she's talking about the end of the world and she's talking about students of prophecy at the end of the world studying the prophetic word and she, saw that, she says that those students of prophecy recognized that the doctrine of the incarnation was invested with a soft glow. Ever read that passage? See, there was a special doctrine at the beginning, the Sabbath, a special doctrine at the end, the doctrine of the incarnation. The, the Millerites open, announced the opening of the judgment. We announced the close of the judgment, right? The Millerites open the, announce the opening of the judgment, don't they? What do we announce? The opening of the judgment, right? The opening of the judgment of the living. But we're also announcing the close of judgment as well. That was a trick question. There's, there's beginnings and endings in, in our history that we recognize, they're all, they always seem to be connected. That's the way the Lord works it. But in our beginning history, the angel Gabriel gave William Miller the commencement to the chain of truth. Okay? And when William Miller says what that commencement point was, there were three of them. 508, 457, and 677. The Millerites were given the commencements to the chain of truth, and what I'm suggesting here in this study is that we've been given the link in the chain of truth. And when you combine those commencement points and the Millerite understanding that is built and based upon 457, 508, and 677, and you bring that together with the links of the chain, then you see the whole chain. Amen. And this chain there isn't one weak link in it. Amen. It is totally complete. Okay, so, so we're going to look at the fact that William Miller was given the commencement points. From the point of view that here at the end, we're given part of the understanding of the chain too. We're given the understanding of the links of a chain. Alright? Page 8. The commencement of the chain of truth. Now, I didn't take time to defend this, this first point, but you can do it on your own. Sister White in Desire of Ages, quoting from Revelation, where it says that the Lord sent His angel to John. She says, His angel is Gabriel. Okay, in the scriptures, His angel is Gabriel. So, in this quote, that isn't being established, but you can understand it if you want to. From early writings 2.29 onward, it says, God sent his angel to move the heart of a farmer who had not believed the Bible to lead him to search the prophecies. God sent Gabriel. God sent Gabriel to Daniel, to John, to William Miller. Angels of God repeatedly visited that, what's it called? Miller was the chosen one. That chosen one to guide his mind and open to his understanding prophecies which had ever been dark to God's people. The commencement of the chain of truth was given to him. Amen. You believe Ellen White? Amen. Amen. That's what she says. He was given the commencement to the chain of truth. Does God waste any words? No. For some reason, Sister White was used to inform us that William Miller was given the commencement to the chain of truth. Okay, so if it's been revealed to us, it's ours forever. It's our children and our possession forever. Reading on. And he was led to search for link after link until he looked with wonder and admiration upon the Word of God. He saw there a perfect chain of truth. That's what we're going to try to deal with here in this particular study this week. The word which he had regarded as uninspired now opened before his vision in its beauty and glory. He saw that one portion of scripture, scripture explains another. 
And when one passage was closed to his understanding, he found in another part of the word that which explained it. He regarded the sacred word with joy and with deep respect and awe. God directed the mind of William Miller to the prophecies and gave him great light on the book of Revelation. Now, this isn't really the focus of this study, but let's think this one through, all right? We, we just agreed that we believed Ellen White, correct? Ellen White said that God, that through the angel Gabriel, gave William Miller great light on the book of Revelation. There's two beasts in Revelation 13, is there not? What's the first beast? Papacy. What's the second beast? What did William Miller think those two beasts were? Pagan Rome and Papal Rome. <laughs> William Miller didn't have so much great light on Revelation 13, did he? Two powers and he was wrong. What about Revelation 14? He thought the end of the world was coming in 1844, didn't he? Well, it was great light. I'm not trying to deny it wasn't great light, but it, it, was, it needed a little bit of understanding there in Revelation 14. You ever read his understanding on Revelation 17? It don't fit, okay? The Millerite understanding of Revelation 17 is not correct, okay? Did William Miller, is he the man the Lord used to come to the understanding of the seven churches of Revelation? No, nope, that predated William Miller. That's Protestant understanding. He agreed with it, but he wasn't given that great light. It was already there. Yet Sister White says William Miller was given great light on the book of Revelation. And we said we believed her. What light was William Miller given on Revelation that's great light that Gabriel gave him? By just the process of elimination, has to be the seals and the trumpets. Oh, what a tragedy that we're willing to take the pioneer understanding of the trumpets and throw it in the trash heap of history here at the end of the world when that is the great light that was given to William Miller on the book of Revelation, according to Ellen White. The process of elimination, it has to be that, the seals and the trumpets. That sound like stretch logic? It's not. <laughs> so, getting back to our point now, here's William Miller, going back to the commencement of the chain of truth, not dealing with the trumpets. It says, this is from a farther study of the scriptures, and I guess that's American English from William, William Miller's day and age. We would probably say further, but he said farther, that's really how it's spelled. From a farther study of the scriptures, I concluded that the seven times of Gentile supremacy must what? What did Sister White say? <coughs> William Miller was given the commencement. Okay, same word. Why did Sister White say that? For us. For the students of prophecy at the end of the world. She left in the record that William Miller had been given the commencement point for the chain of truth. She didn't say what the commencement point was, but she says the commencement point for the chain of truth was given to William Miller. And William Miller tells us what the commencement was. But is, but is William Miller inspired? I mean, does William Miller, did he write any books in the Bible? How about John the Baptist? Does he have a book in the Bible? No. What about Elijah? Uh, Sister White compared William Miller with John and Elijah. <laughs> so you don't necessarily have to have a book in the Bible to be John the Baptist or Elijah. So, does, does John or Elijah have anything in the inspired writings that they wrote? Does William Miller? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he does. Yeah, William Miller's dream is right there in early writings. Okay. So, he's even an author of what we would consider inspired writing. Have you ever studied time prophets, the study of time prophets, at the end of every time prophecy? There's a remnant of people that are raised up and recognize that the message of that time prophecy is present truth to their generation. You ever studied that study? Amen. And at that same time, what else is raised up? A prophet. And what are the characteristics of that prophet? They're a gathering prophet. Their ministry is life or death, right? Noah was one of those kind of prophets, raised up at the end of 120 years. And he, Noah's message was life or death. 
Moses raised up at the end of Abram's 400 or 430 30 year prophecy, however you want to read it. Was Moses' message life or death? So at the a time prophecy that deals with God's people, there's a remnant of people that are raised up that understand that message is present truth. There's a prophet raised up that understand that message is present truth. And that prophet's message is life or death. What else about the prophet? Their name, Their name, corresponds. Their name corresponds to the ministry. Um, Ellen Gold White, the prophet to Laodicea. White raiment, gold tried in the fire, the discernment that is the bright and shining light of God's word, and Ellen means a bright and shining light. So, was there a time prophecy that dealt with God's people that was fulfilled in 1798? Oh, the 2520. Was there a group of people that were raised up in 1798 that began to understand the increase of knowledge from that time prophecy as present truth? By all the other testimonies, there needed to be a prophet that was raised up at that point in time. Who would that be? Ooh. Brothers and sisters, that's William Miller and his name corresponds to his ministry. So, Sister White says he was given the commencement of the chain of truth and when he's telling us what the commencement is, we have the spiritual authority to look at his statement with a little more respect than simply some farmer writing down what his experience was back in the 19th century and he says this, from a farther study of the scriptures, I concluded that the seven times of Gentile supremacy must commence when the Jews cease to be an independent nation at the captivity of Manasseh, which the best chronologers assigned to B.C. 677. That the 2300 day, 2, days commenced with the 70 weeks, which the best chronologers dated from B.C. 457, and that the 1335 days commencing with the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination that make it desolate were to be dated from the setting up of the papal supremacy after the taking away of the pagan abominations and which according to the best historians I could consult should be dated from AD 508. He was given three commencement points. 677, 508, 457. And what are those commencement points, the commencement up? The chain of truth that he was given, that had ever been dark to God's people. Amen. And he accomplished the Lord's will. That was his responsibility, was to accomplish the Lord's will, which of course is what William means. And he was a miller because he was raised at the, up at the time when the book of Daniel was unsealed and men were running to and fro in God's word. And William Miller was one of those men that was running to and fro in God's word. And what's it mean to run to and fro in God's word? It means to separate the wheat from the chaff. Isn't that what we're told about the Bible? Our responsibility with Bible study is to separate the wheat from the chaff. And isn't that what the definition of miller means? <laughs> his name corresponds to his ministry. Okay, now let's move on to the links. Top of page 9, the first link. The message in the regard to the fall of Babylon must be given. God's people are to understand in regard to the angel who is delighting the whole world with its glory while he cries mightily with a loud voice, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen. The solemn events which are now taking place belong to a series of events in the chain of history the first link of which is connected with link, Eden. So where's the first link of the chain begin? Eden? Eden. Okay. Desire of Ages 6.30. From the destruction of Jerusalem, Christ passed on rapidly to the gr greater event, the last link in, this, in the chain of this earth's history, the coming of the Son of God in majesty and glory. Amen. So the chain of prophetic history that we're going to be dealing with begins in Eden and it ends at the second coming of Christ. Begins with the first link, ends with the last link. And is there any differences in a link and a chain? They're all the same. Okay, so what is, in those histories, what is the, the, the sameness that allows us to identify them as a link? It's the 3-1 combination. Okay. Every link is based upon the work of the Holy Spirit. And the work of the Holy Spirit in John 16 is this three-step work. 
John 16, 7 through 11 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Okay. First angel's message is the conviction of sin. In the second angel's message, we're going to see righteousness manifested. And the third is going to be associated with, with judgment. This is the three-step work of the Holy Spirit. William Miller proclaimed the first angel's message convicted the world of sin. In the history of the second angel's message, in the midnight cry, the Millerites manifested the righteousness of Christ as they carried the message across the United States in less than two months, or in roughly two months. And it led to the judgment. The work of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Where else do we see this? We see it throughout the scriptures because this is the link. <laughs> this is the link of the chain that every, every history possesses. This is the courtyard. In the sanctuary. Thy way is in the sanctuary, right? The courtyard is where you come to confess your sins, right? And when you move into the holy place, what's represented in the furnishings of the holy place? Sanctification, the sanctified life. What's represented in the most holy place? Glorification, judgment. Justification, sanctification, glorification, courtyard, holy place, most holy place. Three-step work of the Holy Spirit that's in each of these histories. This is probably familiar to most of us, but in Ministry to Healing 441, it says there is a study of history that is not to be condemned. There is some studies of history that is to be condemned. I'll condemn one for us right now. Brothers and sisters, we need to know, we need to know a certain amount of the the ways that Satan brings mankind into captivity. Okay? There is some things in history that give us evidence of the maneuvers of Satan that we should be familiar with. But there is a study of history where we get so wrapped up into looking at the movements of Satan through history that that is a study of history that needs to be condemned. Amen. And those of us in Adventism that are spending our time studying the conspiracy theories of masonry and all of that that is connected with it are going to find that that time that we were spent, spent that we spent studying those things is times that the Lord was expecting us to have our nose to the grindstone studying His Word. Because His Word is the only Word that contains the power that can change our lives. And we know as Seventh-day Adventists, by beholding we become changed. And if all we're looking at is this foolishness about masonry, and the globalists, and the New World Order, you can rest assured there is absolutely no power in those understandings Amen. that is going to change your heart. And if the Laodicean's heart does not get changed, he receives the mark of the beast, is spewed out of the mouth of the Lord, and he dies for eternity. Amen. So there are some studies of history that are to be condemned. But it's awful interesting stuff for Adventists to look at. It's one of the things you get confronted with with this message, is those among us that are so fascinated with this foolishness that has no power to save. That's right. Nothing's neutral. In the record of his dealings with the nations were traced the footsteps of Jehovah. What are the footsteps of Jehovah? It's the links. All right? It's the links and the chains. It's, uh, it's the candlesticks. It's the will within wills. All right? Those are the footsteps of Jehovah. So today we are to consider the dealings of God with the nations of the earth. We are to see in the history the fulfillment of prophecy to study the workings of providence in the great what? Reformatory movements. Yeah, the Millerite history was a reformatory movement. You wait, you wait till, till Brother Roland shares one of his presentations. Nice insight. Nice insight. Where is he? Uh, okay. You know, he, he's going to nail down where the reformatory movement of the Millerites ended. 
And of course, Sister White says the, the, the work of the fourth angel, that it's a movement. She doesn't say it's a church. She says it's a movement. This, this truth of Adventism, from Millerites to the end, it began with a movement, it ends with a movement. So when did it stop being a movement? And why is that connected with the 2520? Make sure you're here for Roland's presentation. It's very nice. <laughs> it's very nice, okay? We are to see in history the fulfillment of prophecy to study the workings of providence in the great reformatory movements and to understand the progress of events in the marshalling of the nations for the final conflict of the great controversy. Such study will give broad comprehensive views of life. It will help us to understand something of its relation and dependencies, how wonderfully are we are bound together in the great brotherhood of society and nations and how great an extent the oppression and degradation of one member means loss to all. But history, as commonly studied, is concerned with man's achievements, his victories in battles, his success in attaining power and greatness. God's agencies in the affairs of men is lost sight of. Few study the working out of his purpose in the rise and fall of nations. And to a great degree, theology as studied and taught, is but a record of human speculation serving only to darken counsel by words without knowledge. To a great degree, theology, as studied and taught, is but a record of human speculation serving only to darken counsels but words without knowledge. Too often, the motive in accumulating these many books is not so much a desire to obtain food for mind and soul, it is an ambition to become acquainted with the philosophers and theologians, a desire to present Christianity to the people in learned terms and propositions, Amen. such as hermeneutics and exegesis <laughs> and justification and sanctification. The work of Great Controversy 343, the work of God in the, the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the presence have their parallel in those of the, the past, and the experience of the church in former ages has, great lesson, has lessons of great value for our own time. The great reformatory movements are the links in the chain, and every reformatory movement is based upon this three-step process of the Holy Spirit. But we know that this link, this history, isn't complete until the fourth part. Okay? John the Baptist is the first step in the history of Christ. The Sanhedrin closing their door against Christ is the second step. There's a manifestation of righteousness at the triumphal entry that leads to the cross of judgment, the third step, and Pentecost is the fourth. Pentecost pre prefigures the fourth angel's message, the time we're living in today. Amen. The Millerite history, Miller is a type of John the Baptist. Sanhedrin choosing against Christ as the Protestant church is closing their doors against the Millerites. In the Midnight Cry, Sister White uses the history of the triumphal entry to illustrate the Midnight Cry that led to the opening of the judgment that parallels the cross, which was followed by the disappointment of the disciples that Sister White uses to illustrate the disappointment of the Millerites. John the Baptist, William Miller, were prefigured by Moses, who brought a message of reform to the children of Israel in Egypt that led to the resistance of Pharaoh, saying, you gather your own straw as you make the bricks, which was follow, followed by the manifestation of the righteousness of the power of God as the plagues were poured out and led to Passover, which is perfectly typifying the cross, which was therefore typifying 1844, which was followed by the disappointment of the Hebrews at the Red Sea with the Red Sea in front of them and Pharaoh's army behind them, which Sister White uses as a history to illustrate the disappointment of the Millerites on October 23, 1844, which she also says, was prefigured by the disappointment of the disciples immediately after the cross. And after they're crossing the Red Sea, 50 days later, there they are at Sinai receiving the law, which was Pentecost. Every leak in the chain is this 3-1 combination. And the links are always the same. But God is not redundant, so the links are always different too. Okay? So we're going to show that part as well. Um, in, under three tests, Testimonies Volume 4, page 44, when Christ was tempted, Satan tempted him with two temptations or four temptations? Uh, it's, it's three tests. First, Sister White tells us, the first angel's message, second angel's message, third angel's message are three tests. More than once. Christ went through three tests. 
Daniel 12.10, there are three tests. It says, many shall be purified, made white, and tried. If you're convicted of sin, and you come to the foot of the cross, what happens? You're purified. Then what happens? You're made white, as you are sanctified. We're going to use the theological terms. And then what happens? You're tried. Judgment. Same three tests. The same three tests. Three-step three process of the Holy Spirit expressed in a variety of ways. Notice from Review and Herald, October 31st, 1899. Many who went forth to meet their bridegroom under the first and second angel's message re refused the third, the last testing message. So is the third angel's message a testing message for the Millerites? Yeah. But the third angel's message was a testing message. The first and second were testing messages. You have another quote that the third angel's message is also a testing message for our time. But go to the top of page 11, passing over that quote for time. Top of page 11, it says, for Selected Messages, Book 2104, it says, The first and second angel's messages were given in 1843 and 1844, and we're now under the proclamation of the third, but all three of the messages are still to be proclaimed. There cannot be a third without a first and a second. Amen. You, have to have, you can't have a judgment message that isn't preceded by these two messages. This can't happen. This is important to see. This is important to see for a lot of reasons. They're connected, in other words. If you can't have a third without a first and a second, then you can't have a second that isn't preceded by a first and followed by a third. In fact, if you have a first, you have to have a second and a third. That's what she's saying. They're one link. <laughs> they the same history. They can't be separated. It's one link. Um, notice from Great Controversy 389. This is important. See, this is one of the most difficult things, I believe, for, for those of us that are following this message to come to grips with. This quote right here. The Bible declares that before the coming of the Lord, Satan will work with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. And they that receive not the love of the truth that th they might be saved will be left to receive strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Not until this condition shall be reached. Not until Seventh-day Adventists receive strong delusion because they've rejected the three-step testing process for their time period and therefore they're left in perfect darkness. Not till Seventh-day Adventists reach this condition and then receive the strong delusion of Second Th Thessalonians chapter 2. Not until this condition shall be reached and the union of church and state with the world shall be fully accomplished throughout Christendom will the fall of Babylon be complete. The change is a progressive one and the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14.8 is yet future. We teach that in the summer of 1844 the second angel's message of Revelation 14.8 was fulfilled and it was. But this history here of the Millerites according to Sister White's Verbiage, this was an imperfect fulfillment of the three angels' message. And you know that it was. What's the third angel's message? It's a warning against receiving the mark of the beast. Was there a Sunday law on October 22nd, 1844? Was this the third angel's message arriving on October 22nd, 1844? Yes, but it was imperfect. All right? What do we mean by imperfect? It typified the perfect fulfillment of it at the end of the world. And just as Miller, as a symbol of the first angel's message, the Protestant church is closing their doors as a symbol of the second angel's message, the closing door of the holy place on October 24th is the imperfect fulfillment of the three angels' messages. So John the Baptist in the history of Christ, followed by the Sanhedrin closing their doors, and the judgment of the cross was also an imperfect fulfillment of the three angels' messages. As was Moses' reform message, followed by Pharaoh's rejection of that reform message, and the judgment of Passover was an imperfect fulfillment of the three angels' message. And when is the perfect fulfillment of the third angel's message? At the Sunday Law. And what happens at the Sunday Law? Well, let's say it this way. What happened for the Millerites here? A door closed. A door closed. At the third test, the door closes. Where does the door close for Adventism? Sunday Law. So, so if this is our third test here at the end of the world. Do we have any tests before we get there? Yes. It's the repetition of the three angels' messages. 
This message that tested the Millerites, the first angel's message, when was it empowered? It was empowered when the mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down with the little book of Daniel open in his hand. And this history is prefiguring our history. That history was imperfect. It was pointing forward to the perfect repetition. Therefore, you're saying this is the Sunday law for us. Before the Sunday law, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has to come down. Because the imperfect illustrations throughout the scriptures identify that without a doubt. Okay, in, on page 11, you see the first angel's message which the Millerites proclaimed. It says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God. That message was empowered in 1840. The first angel's message goes on to say, and give him glory. And the Millerites, they gave him glory here. 1842, second angel's message. For the hour of his judgment has come, 1844. History of the Millerites, history of the first angel's message. They perfectly fulfilled the first angel's message. Fear God. Give him glory. Manifest righteousness. The hour of his judgment has come and worship him who's made heaven and earth and the sea and the things that therein are. What's that? Sabbath. Immediately after 1844, they have to understand the Sabbath. Millerites fulfilled the first angel's message. They fulfilled the three angels' message, but only imperfectly. It's perfectly fulfilled at the end of the world. Right? Everyone see that? Okay. One more quote. We're almost done. Two more quotes. We're almost done. Great Controversy 393, the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. Door closed for Millerites right here. Door closes for us at the Sunday Law. And when it does so, the wise and foolish virgins are going to demonstrate the character that they prepared in their previous hours of probation. Review in Herald Ox 19th, 1890. When the third angel's message is preached as it should be, power attends its proclamation. It becomes an abiding influence. It must be attended with divine power. It will accomplish nothing. I'm often referred to, you know how the third angel's message is preached as it should be? If it's going to have power with it, brothers and sisters, the third angel's message has to be a message that produces two classes of worshipers. If it's preached to an audience and it doesn't drive the audience one direction or the other direction, then it's not being preached as it should be. The third angel's message is not simply describing the theological terms that are associated with the three angels' message in Revelation 14. The third angel's message is a message that when it's preached as it should be, produces two classes of worshipers based on how they relate to that message. I'm often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has special application to this time, and like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth to the close of time. In the parable, the ten virgins had lamps, but only five of them had saving oil with which to keep their lamps burning. What's the saving oil? What's the golden oil that comes down out of the pipes in the story of Zechariah? Why does Sister White say the, what, what does Sister White say the golden oil that comes down to the two pipes are? It's the messages of God's Spirit. So what makes the difference between a wise and foolish virgin? One receives the third angel's message and is a wise virgin, and the other rejects the third angel's message and is a foolish virgin. When the third angel's message is preached as it should be, it's going to produce two types of virgins. Because the parable of the ten virgins illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. And the Adventist people are the people that end up in two camps based upon whether they have the oil or they don't have the oil. And the oil is the special message that comes to God's people at the end of the world, which is summarized as the third angel's message. And what does Sister White says the work of the third angel is to do? Separate the wheat from the tares. And who's the wheat from the tares? It's the wise and foolish virgins. And if you're not preaching the third angel's message from that context, if you think you're a preacher of the third angel's message in Adventism today, and you're getting praise from men, and no one is resisting what you're saying, you're self-deceived. The third angel's message is a message that always causes a shaking, and it always produces two classes of people. Or it is powerless, and if it's powerless, it's not the genuine third angel message. Shall we pray?
Heavenly Father, we wish to be among those that participate in the work of the third angel. And we wish to be among those that are teaching it with power. With the power that changes lives. Either direction. We wish that all would receive this message and be classified as a wise virgin, as a wheat. But we know that this isn't what takes place in your church at this time. And we put that into your hands. You're the one that has to do the, the determination on that part. But we wish to participate in this work. We wish to understand um, what our role is in it. We wish to be empowered with the information necessary to convey this message. And we wish to be changed into your image that we have the experience that qualifies us, that allows you to use us in this work. For it's easy to see at this time that you are finishing your work, that it's moving quickly, and we want to be part of that work, part of, part of those that participate in that work. So we ask that this week here, um, these messages, the fellowship that we have in between these messages, uh, that your Holy Spirit would have his way with each of us, uh, that you would point us in the right directions um, individually that we need to be going in uh, to accomplish the experience and the understanding that is needed by all of us to be among your messengers at this time. Thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.